Okay, so this is our first lecture. It's going to be on um, chapter one, which is an introduction to um, sociology. Um, most of our lectures will take the form of this introductory lecture. So I will always tell you, one, the topic that we are going to discuss, and two, at the end, I will tell you what to look forward to. So again, we are getting started with chapter one in our sociology text reader. And chapter one is entitled An Introduction to Sociology. Okay, so right now I'm going to save, not save, but share my screen with you guys. Um, you guys will always see the same thing that I'm seeing. So you guys have now access to the PowerPoints for this lecture. Okay. So chapter one, an introduction to sociology. Sociologists study how society affects people and how people affect society. So in other words, sociology is going to study um, ways in which society operates, right? So we're going to look at patterns, trends, and themes, um, such as homelessness, racism, class, gender, age, ability, or lack of, and see how those things in society affect people. And also how people, how we can also affect society negatively and positively. Um, so people affecting society will take will often look like people creating and influencing society, people diminishing or getting rid of certain things and that influencing society. Look at how medicine, um, the creation of medicines influences society, the creation of technology influences society. Um, in 2020, um, in 2019 as well, Look at how Uber and Lyft have influenced and affected society, so much so that we've seen those two types of transportation services impact um, taxi services, okay? So, so sociology, again, studies how society affects um, people and how people affect society. Sociology though, what is it, right? Sociology is the study of groups and interactions. So we're going to be looking at groups and in these interactions on a macro, a meso, and a micro level. So, so we'll also be looking at societies, social interactions from small and personal groups to very large groups. Sociologists who learn about society as a whole while studying one-to-one -one and also group interactions as we just or as i just stated your text first um after going through the definition of sociology which i just went through um goes over the sociological imagination what is the sociological imagination so the sociological imagination is a concept that is developed by c wright mills um, and in this, he described the sociological imagination as the intersection between history and biography. What does he mean by history and biography? When you come across questions like this in your reader, make sure you actually sit back and think about it, right? So again, he described the sociological imagination as an intersection between history and biography. When he mentions biography, he's talking about the personal, right? Um, our personal experiences, our own realities, etc. When he talks about history, he's talking about external forces, things that we cannot control, okay? Being able to distinguish between history and personal biography being able to distinguish between those two and seeing where the two overlap 
is very, very, very important. Within his um, essay on the sociological imagination, C. Wright Mills also brings up two concepts, such um, these concepts are the public issues and private concerns or personal troubles. I personally like to use personal troubles, okay? Um, so um, an example of public, well, we'll start off with private concerns or personal troubles first, right? Personal troubles, are troubles and issues that we as people have played a part in. So let me give you guys an example. Let me give you guys a example using myself, right? Imagine if we were in a face-to-face -face class and I'm supposed to arrive to class every day at 8 a.m. And I don't do that. Instead, I arrive late. I arrive at 8.15, 8.30. And on top of that, um, I'm constantly letting students out early or um, I'm eating during class or I'm highly disrespectful and rude to faculty, admin, staff, and students themselves. And I get fired. That firing is due to my, my lack of being a good teacher. I'm not following the rules. I'm not following what my contract says. I'm not teaching you guys the proper things, etc. That become a private concern. That firing happened due to my own neglect, due to my carelessness, okay? A public issue, on the other hand, is an issue that arises that is beyond people's control, okay? So for instance, I'm working at a factory. This happened all around Massachusetts, right? I work at a factory in Massachusetts, and all of a sudden, um, the factory gets shipped overseas or it is now out of business. That becomes a public issue. Now, some of you might think that this is actually a private concern, but it becomes a public issue for several reasons. One, as we know, if C. Wright Mills is telling us to look at not just personal biography, but history, I had, as an individual, and as individuals who work at this factory, we had nothing to do with this factory closing, okay? We, just imagine we were all arriving to work on time, we're producing product above and beyond, however the company gets shipped overseas or it closes, okay? On top of that, right, it becomes a public issue because that factory or that business leaving that area affects that community. Look at Lawrence, Massachusetts. Look at Lowell, Massachusetts. Look at Salem, Massachusetts. A lot of our towns in Massachusetts used to be mill towns, okay? When these mills get shut down, Look at the impact that these mills have on that community once they leave or once they get shut down, okay? It does what, right? The closing of a factory makes people jobless. That affects the community. When people become jobless, think about the, fam the impact on the family that it's going to have, these families, okay? God forbid, but imagine if you were a student and your parents worked at this mill. You, it might have an effect on your education in the long run, right? You might now need to get employed. Becomes a public issue. I have an example here. So for example, unemployment is often looked at as a private matter. So it's looked at as a private concern or a personal trouble. But when you look at events such as recessions or economic downturns, 
Look at COVID, COVID-19, what it had, the impact it had on unemployment. That should look like a public issue to not just me, but to you, okay? Many people who are considered non-essential workers are now laid off or for the meantime, jobless. And again, some of these jobs aren't coming back. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but some of them aren't coming back, okay? Um, but if your parents, if you became jobless due to the pandemic and people having to quarantine, are you going to want to use, or are you gonna want people to use their personal biography to assess your situation? Okay, and it might look some, and if I'm using a personal lens or my personal biography to assess the situation, right? It might sound messed up. Okay, it might sound like, well, you should have prepared for a pandemic. I mean, it's your fault you got laid off. You should have been working harder. You could have been an essential worker. Okay, or do you want people to use a public issue type of lens, right? Use that historical side of the sociological imagination, right? We had nothing, like we couldn't have predicted a pandemic coming in 2020, okay? It's not my fault and it's not your fault that you got laid off. You can't control big businesses, big corporations. You can't control whether or not you self-quarantine, you have to self-quarantine, okay? So using the sociological imagination, it's more than just thinking outside of the box, right? You're using your personal biography, external forces or history, seeing the way that these things overlap and seeing how they don't, and then assessing, okay? I want you guys to think of now examples, real life examples of public issues and private concerns. I'll give you a few to start off, right? Some public issues. And again, you can actually like debate me in your mind. I know we can't debate face to face, not yet. Okay, because this is not a live Zoom. But I'm gonna list a couple of topics and you tell me whether or not they're public issues or private concerns. Homelessness. Student debt. Healthcare, immigration, let's say COVID-19, this pandemic. Think about whether or not those are public issues or private concerns, okay? And hmm, maybe I actually might do a flip grid. I would actually want you guys to discuss this on um, an app that you guys should download or you don't have to download, but respond to it. I want to know what you guys think of that, okay? But I'll get to that at a later point, at the end of this lecture. People have been thinking like sociologists using the sociological imagination long before sociology became a separate academic discipline. People such as Plato, Aristotle, Confucius, Caldun, Voltaire, all set the stage for modern sociology, okay? So sociology isn't new. People have always thought in sociological manners, okay? It's just that now we have a discipline for it. You don't need to know dates in this class at all, however, it might be important for you know, to know some foundations, right? So I'm gonna give you a few, but you must know after this slide, the next four theorists, like the back of your hand, know them and know their ideologies, okay? Their theories. However, the roots of sociology. Sociology has its roots in Europe particularly the 18th and the 19th century. And it's during this time 
that we see the French Revolution, the American Revolution, colonialism, industrial revolution, and the Enlightenment all going on, right? We see a lot of changes in society, specifically demographic changes. What do I mean by demographic, right? We see people immigrating into different regions that they are not native to, right? Immigrating, emigrating, like migrating, okay? What does this, why is this important, right? Think of what's going on during the industrial, the industrial revolution, right? People are coming from rural areas and into urban centers, right? How does that change a population? You have to think about it, right? The enlightenment, it's during this time, we have a booming of the arts, right? When I say arts, I'm not talking about just drawings and paintings, right? But I'm talking about music, I'm talking about architecture, okay? How does that change a society, right? How does um, the advancement of technologies, right, influence or impact a society? How does medicine? impact the society, right? People are living longer, right? Um, the death rate during birth is decreasing, etc. So sociology offers up an explanation as to why people are moving and shifting, why people are living longer, why profits are up, why businesses are booming, etc. Okay? Sociologists also, because of all of these things, develop theories to explain occurrences such as protests. It's not limited to protests, but sociology today, definitely in 2020, can be used to explain a lot of things that we see, if not all things that we see in society. Sociology can explain the Black Lives Matter movement. Sociology can explain the pandemic and the ways that people are behaving around the pandemic, right? People, um, common folks such as you and I, as well as people um, within the elite, okay? Sociology can help explain immigration patterns. Sociology can explain the current recession that we're in, okay? Sociology can explain why borders are locked and why um, countries view America in a certain light, and not just America, but certain Western countries in a way, and have why we view them in another way, okay? And that's why I find sociology so fascinating, right? It's one of those subjects that is just it has answers, right? It has answers as to why, right? It doesn't necessarily have answers as to how to fix, right? But it has answers as to why are all of these things going on? So as I said, right, you need to know just a couple of things of the foundations, right? But you must know the next four theorists I'm going to go over. I'm going to go over Emile Durkheim, Karl Marx, Max Weber, and George Herbert Mead. You need to know them and their ideas like the back of your hand. You need to carry these three theories on for the remainder of the semester. They're not hard, they're not difficult, um, and honestly, they should be able to help you the farther we get along, answering a lot of the questions that we have about occurrences that are happening out there, okay? So the first one um, is the functionalist perspective, and this is associated primarily with Emile Durkheim. So Emile Durkheim is the main person associated with functionalism. He's a French scholar working in the late 19th century and early 20th century, and he's famous for establishing the world's first sociology department, okay? The thing about Emil Durkheim is that he is focused on order and organization in society. He says that people 
society likes to keep things at an equilibrium, right? We like things to remain balanced, peaceful, ordered, and organized. However, systems are set up so that society can keep at equilibrium. And why do we have these systems? He says that people are born flawed, okay? I'm not saying necessarily bad, but people are born flawed, okay? And because people are born flawed, we have systems set up to teach us how to, how do I say it? To teach us how to be proper, okay? To teach us how to keep order and organization, okay? We're, when we get into the, what the, type, the specific types of systems we look at, at in sociology, we'll get to them, right? But when I, I'll give you a couple of examples. When I say systems, I'm talking about systems such as educational systems or structures, family systems or structures, religious systems or structures, state systems or structures. And when I'm talking about the states, I'm talking about policies and laws. These things keep society ordered and organized. And order and organization is restored through common values and beliefs, okay? So because people are flawed, these systems, again, will keep, um, will in society, be, these systems are set up so that society can function well and keep this order in our organization. But you and I know that even though we have all of these systems in society that are meant to keep things ordered and organized, some people remain flawed. Okay. However, there's always a system that can take care of them. So for instance, Okay. We, for the most part, learn through family, learn through education, learn to, through our interactions with peers and others that stealing, killing, bribery, theft are wrong. Those are just some examples, right? However, there are individuals that do those things even later on in life. And where do those individuals end up being or end up going once they're caught? Prison, okay? Jail. That's also a system. It's also a structure, right? And we keep those individuals there to keep everything in order and in organization. Those systems are also set up, right? Prisons, although I'm not in prison, although you're not in prison, right? We're like learning right here. Those systems, that prison system, that um, criminal justice system is set up to also keep us in place because we know that if we step out of bounds, we could go to those places as well. But when we get to our chapter on deviance, social control, and crime, we'll talk more about that. But that's the functionalist perspective, okay? So Emil Durkheim states that, just a review, Emil Durkheim states that because we are born flawed, right, um, and because we want things to remain ordered and organized and at an equilibrium, there are certain systems that are set up in society so that it can function well. Karl Marx is our next theorist. He is um, linked to the conflict perspective. However, Karl Marx was one of the founders of sociology. Emil was too, Max Weber is, and G.H. Lee. His ideas about social conflict are still relevant today. Okay, we can actually see a lot of Karl Marx's ideas at play today in 2020. So again, the conflict perspective. Karl Marx is most known for this perspective. 
Um, he thought that the economy was the base of society and everything else was the superstructure. So the economy influences or affects, right, all other aspects of your life. Let's think about that for a sec, right? How does the economy, how does your salary, how does your wages, what does it influence? What does it influence in your life, right? I'm just thinking out loud, but my salary and wages dictate my education. My salary and wages dictate my health care, whether or not I can receive certain types of health care. My salary or wages dictate the neighborhood I can live in. My salary and wages dictate my friendships. Okay, most of us are friends with people within our own salary brackets. Um, my salary and wages can also dictate the types of food, something as minimal as the type of foods I eat. I don't even wanna say minimal because food's important, it's essential, right? But it can dictate that. So can, does the economy dictate a lot of your lives? That is another question I could pose on Flipgrid, okay? Conflict though, before I get into the conflict aspect of Karl Marx, where Emile is saying that people are born essentially flawed, Karl Marx is saying people are born essentially good. They're rational. We naturally want an ordered life, order and organization like the functionals, right? However, conflict comes from competition over scarce resources. Many of you should have um, gone over Das Kapital, written by Karl Marx in your social science classes in high school, or even in your history classes, same thing, in high school, right? Das Kapital, this might sound familiar to some of you, um, discusses the conflict, the competition over scarce resources between the proletariat, the working class, and the bourgeoisie, right? The elite or the wealthy, the extremely wealthy. Okay, this competition leads to inequality, which is an unnatural state. And that is where essentially good and rational people, I don't want to say go crazy. It sounds, if I was talking to my friend, that friends, I'd be like, go crazy. But this competition that leads to inequality, which is in an unnatural, which is an unnatural state, leads to people popping off, okay? And I'm not talking about bang, bang, but people just doing things that they wouldn't normally do if, the if things were just fair, okay? If there wasn't economic inequality, Karl Marx focuses on that, so that's what I'm saying, okay? He says that capitalism is the primary culprit of inequality. So for instance, using your sociological imagination, right? We could look at a mother during COVID-19 who has been laid off and now she has been caught stealing food for herself and her children in two different ways, right? Right now, right? So we could look at it from a functional lens. Well, the functionalist might say what? Really think about it. The crime is the crime. You do the crime, you create time, right? Order, we have order and organization in society already right? You shouldn't have been stealing. You wouldn't be in prison right now and you would be with your kids right now if you didn't steal. That's the functionalist perspective. However, if I want to use the conflict perspective, right? 
I'm going to look beyond the systems that are set up. In fact, the conflict of perspective might actually say the systems are actually set up and they're, they're faulty, right? The conflict perspective might say, you know, um, she was laid off due to COVID. On top of that, right, she probably was unable to save enough money for emergencies because there is such competition over scarce resources. Okay, I didn't say a job, but imagine if this mother was working at Target or imagine if this mother was working um, as an environmental specialist, AKA janitor at a hospital. And yes, they laid off at hospitals during COVID-19. So don't think that they, those jobs like were all safe, okay? My sister works at a hospital, okay? Um, the, con the conflict perspective would say, these individuals are at the bottom. They are part of the proletariat. They're part of the working class. They do not get paid enough anyways. So because she's laid off, she was put and she was forced into that predicament. I want you guys to think, imagine if you guys lost everything. And I really mean lost everything, right? Imagine, I know most of you are in college right now, right? High school or college, because some of you are high school students. But imagine if your parents lost their job. Them losing their job leads to your home being foreclosed on. The refrigerator starts getting empty. Your belly start growling the bills start piling up. Your income as a student goes away as well, okay? You're essentially good people. At least Karl Marx would say that, you're rational. However, you've been forced into this predicament that is beyond your control, right? If we're putting this in COVID-19 in this area, right? Think of the things that you might do as good people. Okay. Would you resort to stealing? Robbery? Certain types of deviant behaviors. That's just a question. Okay. That's the conflict perspective, okay? We're rational people. We want an ordered life, but competition leads to inequality. An example of this would be the Occupy Wall Street movement that happened worldwide, right? Where you had the 99% occupying parks and public spaces saying that it's not fair that the 1%, those billionaires and trillionaires, your Mark, your uh, Jeff Bezos, your Mark Zuckerbergs, your Bill Gates, it's not fair that these individuals hoard a majority of the wealth and we are fighting over scraps, okay? We're good. We follow these systems. But Karl Marx says that, that there will be a point where people will rise up. And rise up, again, it doesn't mean violence all the time. It means protest, okay? Occupy Wall Street was a protest movement. Occupying is a, a way that the voiceless can now become heard. Let's occupy these spaces, okay? That's the conflict perspective from Karl Marx's perspective. Max Weber, another sociologist, dealing with inequality, but he doesn't just wanna focus on economic inequality. So he's in conversation with Karl Marx. 
his pieces are, not him talking to Karl Marx. But he's looking at social stratification, right? And he's looking at um, within terms of class, status, and party. And essentially what he's saying to Karl Marx's, Marx's um, theory is that it's not always based on the economy, okay? It's not always based on wages and someone's salary. We can also look at status. We can also look at political affiliation slash party. We can also look at, and we've tagged on to um, Baber's work, we can also look at gender. We can also look at race. We can also look at ability or lack of. We can look at age, okay? We can look at sexual orientation, okay? Because sometimes one of these other things could be the base in someone's life. It's not always the economy, okay? As someone who is part of the middle class, the middle mill, because we have different tiers and we'll talk about that when we get our class, um, when we get into class, race, and gender. But someone who's part of the middle middle, not upper middle, not necessarily lower middle, but middle middle class, who is black, who is also a woman and able-bodied, I can say about myself that sometimes my race will dictate certain other circumstances in my life, as well as my gender, okay? Race and class for me are often intertwined, okay? So for instance, race, and again, it takes nothing but a quick Google search, right? But race can dictate my healthcare. And when I say healthcare, the medical services and how well the medical services I receive are, okay? I will say right now that as somebody who is in their 30s, right, one of the things I am most fearful of, specifically in the United States because of the high death rates, is giving birth to a kid as a Black woman in the United States. My race can dictate also the neighborhood and the housing that I live in. My race can dictate the education that I'm allowed to receive. My race can dictate whether or not and where I get employed, okay, um, et cetera. Same thing with my gender. Okay, so it's not always, so Max Weber is saying a very similar thing to Karl Marx, but he's saying, you know what, Karl Marx, we can't just look at the economy. Again, we're different. For some people, it might be their gender that dictates all these other things, the superstructure. It might be their sexual orientation that dictates the superstructure. It might be their disability that dictates the superstructure. Get it? And again, we see these at play outside in our world today. An example of the, the, the conflict perspective from, Carl, from um, Max Weber's lens is the Black Lives Matter movement, okay? Again, people rise up when competition over resources, and in this sense, it's not economic, right? But it's resources that revolve around race or unjust. Things pop off. Same thing with LGBTQIA movements. When these individuals feel that they've been unjustly treated, things pop off. And when I say pop off, maybe I shouldn't use pop off because I'm not saying, you know, like, again, I'm not saying violence. I'm not saying something crazy, like radical, right? But these individuals will really occupy spaces to get laws changed, to help them be on a level playing field with others. 
okay? Native American movements, American Indian movements, those are another example. Good, okay. The last perspective I wanna go over is the symbolic interactionist perspective by um, George Herbert Mead. And I should have typed out his full name, but George Herbert Mead, okay? So George Herbert Mead, the symbolic, so yes, okay. So George Herbert Mead, he is the only social psychologist out of the theorists that I have mentioned, Emile Durkheim, Karl Marx, Max Weber, okay? His emphasis is on human agency, okay? So while the other perspectives were looking at um, how individuals operate within systems, George Herbert Mead is looking at how individuals interact with each other in terms of like the language, the symbols that they are using with each other. Okay, so human agency, what does that mean? Again, if there are words in this lecture that you don't understand their meaning, Google, right? But human agency, do we have a certain amount of human agency? Do we have a certain amount of control over our lives, okay? He says that we do. We have the ability to influence the world. We also can recreate society through everyday life and symbols. I'm gonna take an example from your textbook because it nicely um, explains it. But um, social scientists who apply symbolic interactionist thinking look for patterns of interactions between the individuals. So not the system, right, but individuals. Um, so their studies involve observations one and one-on-one -on -one interactions. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Humans interact with things based on meanings ascribed to those things. The ascribed meaning of things comes from our interactions with others and the society. The meanings of things are interpreted by a person when dealing with things in specific circumstances. For example, if you love books, a symbolic interactionist might propose that you learn that the books are good or important in the interactions that you had with family, friends, school, or church. Maybe your family had a special reading time each week. Getting your library card was treated as a special event or bedtime stories were associated with warmth and comfort, okay? So it's the way that we view, the ways that we interpret the language within those structures where we are able to influence our world and think about our world or recreate the world. So here, Another example, if you're still not getting it, think about certain types of length. Ooh, I have a good one. <laughs> I have a good one and I didn't think about this pre-lecture, okay? And it's 2020, so I'm gonna use this example because it's relevant. Think about our national anthem. Okay, the U.S. National Anthem, okay? What, the, the National Anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance, let's just put them together, right? What do those things mean to you, right? What does it mean to stand up at, when the Pledge of Allegiance is going on, what does that mean to you? Okay. The reason I think that this is a really important example is because what that national anthem, 
what that Pledge of Allegiance means to you is not the same as maybe your classmate, I, I was gonna say next to you, but some of your classmates. It might not be the same thing to me. Again, we're different people, okay? We live in different realities. Not that your reality is real and mine is false or mine is real and yours is false, but look it. I live in Malden, Massachusetts. Some of you are living in Newburyport, Amesbury, etc. Your lives are very different to my lives. My parents recently became citizens of the United States. Okay? Some of your parents have their roots and foundations here in the United States. We view things very, very different, okay? I'm not saying that things don't overlap. Use your sociological imagination, right? Definitely. When I look at the national, when I hear the national anthem, when I hear the Pledge of Allegiance, when I see the American flag, those things symbolize so many things that we probably could relate on. Certain freedoms peace, justice, liberty for all, okay? But again, there are certain things that I deal with because my base is very different, right? I am black, I am a woman, I am, well, I grew up in the working class, although like we're well off right now. Um, it doesn't, it's different, okay? I'll explain it later, but it's different. And that's where symbolic interactionism comes in, okay? I can also recreate these symbols, okay? So the flag, for example, means something to you however meanings can change over the over time question do you think that people overseas view the american flag the way we view the american flag you know we view the american flag in the united states patriotic freedom etc however do you think that people in Portugal would see that symbol the same way? Let's say Western countries, do you think that they would see it the same way? Or could it be a symbol of something not so nice? Okay. The N word. It's another language is different. Okay. We can influence the world through language. The N-word, a term of oppression used to hold down a population for 200 years, still is a term of oppression. However, have people been able to recreate society, and I'm not saying all of society, right, but their communities through this language? Because there are people who use that term as a term of endearment, fellowship, brothership, okay? Something to think about. So, just to go a little further, symbolic interaction theory analyzes society by addressing the subjective meanings that people impose on objects, events, and behaviors. Subjective meanings are given primacy because it's believed that people behave based on what they believe and are not just on what is objectively true. This society is thought to be socially constructed through human interpretation. People interpret one another's behavior and these interpretations form social bonds. Okay, so that's chapter one. Make sure, so what I want you to take away from this lecture, one, what is sociology? 
to what is the sociological imagination and concepts that are linked to the sociological imagination. I want you to be able to use your sociological imagination, so your own personal biographies as well as the histories, to analyze things around you, to analyze events that might have happened to you or that you're witnessing on television. Three, and this is the last, but our three main perspectives in sociology. These are foundational, right? The functionalist perspective, who is, which is linked to Emile Durkheim. The conflict perspective, which is linked to Karl Marx and Max Weber. And then the symbolic interactionist perspective, which is linked to um, George Herbert Mead. Okay, so that's chapter one. So next week, you will have a lecture similar to this for chapter two, okay? Chapter two is on research methods. That lecture will actually be short. I don't expect you guys to all be like, ooh, I wanna be like a sociologist, okay? I'm gonna go over it, but it's probably gonna be a lot shorter. Okay, so you do, you don't actually have a writing assignment, but this is the first lecture, okay? I'm going to actually open Flipgrid. I want to make sure you guys are participating. So Flipgrid is an app that you can choose to download or you don't have to, but I'm gonna post some of the questions that I asked in this lecture to you guys on Flipgrid. I want you to give me your full name, you don't have to, um, you can actually black out your face. You don't have to use a face. You can use a stuffed animal or something like that. Tell me your name and then start answering the question. Sound good? Okay, guys. So thank you for dealing with this lecture. I hope that it wasn't too boring. Um, but I can't wait to start the semester. I think it's going to be a great semester. So stay safe and I'll see you next week. I'll also be seeing you on Flipgrid. Peace out, guys.